Thank you, Miss Stacy and Dad. Roger Dale. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John. And verse number 28. Here in our text, we are at the end of Passion Week. Just before the crucifixion of Jesus. At this point in the 18th chapter of John's Gospel, we're in the middle of a series of trials that the Lord Jesus was put through. There were three of them with the Jewish leaders. We looked at those last week. And then there were three of them with Gentile leaders. In all, there were six trials to this, the most severest miscarriage of justice in the history of the world. And I say that because the recipient of the injustice is God in human flesh. So let's start today by reading our text in verses 28 through 38. The Word of God says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to them, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. To fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth Here's my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Now let me give just a little bit of a lead up for the benefit of our guest today. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and identified by Judas and taken away, he was brought first to Annas, the high priest. And every bit of that first trial was absolutely illegal, as every phase was, even according to Jewish law. There was an attempt to find Jesus guilty of a crime, but that was impossible because he had committed no crime. After enduring insults, being smacked in the face by one of the temple police, look at verse 24, and you can look on your screen as well. It says, so Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Jewish high priests were priests for life in Judaism, but the Romans didn't like that. They didn't want one guy amassing power over accumulated years of time. So the Romans made the Jews switch out high priest every once in a while. And that's why it says in verse 13 that Caiaphas was the high priest that year. Caiaphas was Annas' son-in-law. So Annas was like the godfather of the high priest. 
And over the years, he had put five of his sons and one of his grandsons in the role while he was still behind the scenes running things, what was really a a criminal enterprise, a classic extortion racket with the money changers and the sacrificial animals. And now he had his son-in-law installed. So when Jesus gets to Caiaphas, it's still extremely early in the darkness of Good Friday morning. The Sanhedrin is rushed in, middle of the night, and they hold a trial. And it is a mock trial. Because doing this at night in secret is absolutely illegal according to Jewish law. And they sentence Jesus to death. John doesn't record that. The other gospel writers do. And since what they had done was illegal, and they knew it, in order to legitimize this severe injustice, early in the dawn of that Friday, right at daybreak when the sun was coming up, they assemble again to hold another mock trial, very briefly according to Matthew 27, And it lasted just long enough in the daytime when it was supposed to be happening to again pronounce the death sentence on Jesus, which made it legal for them because now it was day, it was public, even though none of this was legal. None of the trials were really trials. They were actually all parts of a very real long-standing Murder plot. It was murder, plain and simple. And John then in our text for today picks up the story as now we go and move the trial into the Gentile world. And there will be three phases to this trial. First before Pilate, the second before Herod, and then Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate. So let's start in verse 28 which begins with, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium. That is the Roman judgment hall. And this is a very dramatic event. And the drama that plays out here is tied to the people and the personalities that all play a role. It is really a clash and an interplay of personalities all of whom are wicked, all of whom are sinful, all of whom in some way or another, are culpable for this miscarriage of justice we're about to read about. There's only one person in this whole event that shines forth as righteous and all-glorious, and it's King Jesus. He is mocked. He is despised. He is ridiculed. He is treated like a common criminal and sentenced to death. And yet, in his holiness and in his majesty that dominates the scene, it does so against the backdrop of their sin, as we're going to see. Now, who are these personalities? Where there's Annas, as I said, the patriarchal high priest. There's Caiaphas, the current acting high priest. There's the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish supreme court of Israel. There is Pilate, the Roman procurator and governor. There is Herod Antipas, an Idumean king. He ruled in the area, nothing but a puppet king for Rome. There are false witnesses. There are screaming crowds crying for the blood of Jesus. There are Roman soldiers. There are Roman executioners. All of those evil people are amassed to make happen what happened to God when he became a man and lived in this world. That's what man did to God when he came as a man to this place. This is the holy, pure, blameless Son of God on trial like a criminal. In Luke 23, testimony is given regarding Christ. It says he has done nothing wrong. Certainly this man was innocent. Paul says he knew no sin. The writer of Hebrews says he was without sin, holy, holy harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. 
the glory of Christ in these trials is seen in stark contrast to all these other characters. His perfection is on display all throughout each and every moment. And the harder they work to accuse him of being a blasphemer and a threat and an insurrectionist, the more majestic he appears. Now let's think first about these Jewish religious leaders, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. They are all rulers of Israel. As you know, at this time, Israel was under Roman occupation. The Romans at this point had basically conquered the Mediterranean world. They have final power, final authority over all the nations they've conquered, including Israel. So the nation is under Caesar. It's under Roman law. It's occupied by Roman troops. Roman taxes are being collected from the people. And very obviously, the Jews hate this. They despise the condition that they are living under. The Romans are pagans. And from the Jews' perspective, they are outside the pale of God's concern as Gentiles. But the Romans were gracious to a degree. They did allow the nations that they conquered under their rule a certain amount of self-government. They, they had allowed that in Israel. But they did not allow the Jews to exercise the death penalty. Old Testament law had established the death penalty. Genesis 9 still establishes the death penalty. And Israel, following the law of God, had the right to exercise capital punishment for criminals. The death penalty was designed by God to be a deterrent. And when it is used correctly, with swiftness, it is a deterrent. But under Roman rule, the right to the death penalty had been rescinded from the Jews. It was called the right of the sword, and it belonged only to Rome. But, have you ever thought about the fact that even though that was true, it didn't seem to bother the Jews when they stoned Stephen, did it? In Acts 7, because of what he preached. They crushed out his life. They didn't have a discussion about, oh, we can't do this because it's forbidden by Roman law. There was no discussion about the fact that the Romans might bring some repercussions upon us for stoning Stephen. So why, all of a sudden, are they so concerned about getting the Romans to execute Jesus? They didn't do it with Stephen. So why make an issue out of the death of Jesus and you have to have Rome involved? Some might say, well, they didn't want to do it because it was Passover and there were hundreds of thousands of Jews in Jerusalem at that time. Many of them knew the miracles of Jesus. Many of them had hailed Him as Messiah when He came into Jerusalem in His triumphal entry. So, so maybe they didn't want to do this for the fear of the people. There is that possibility. But that in itself isn't the real reason. And we're going to get to that a little later. The Jewish leaders have wanted Jesus dead literally for years at this point. From the time he cleared out the temple at the start of his ministry all the way to where he repeated that act again here at the end of his ministry, they had been tracking him, as you know, all around Galilee. And on a number of occasions, they even tried to kill him. They tried to kill him in Nazareth. They weren't looking for the Romans then, right? They would have thrown him off a cliff and stoned him to death but he escaped from their midst. So why all of a sudden now do they need Rome? The Jewish Talmud records this. Forty years before the destruction of the temple, which was in 70 AD, judgment in matters of life and death was taken away from Israel. So actually it was around 30 AD that this was removed from the Jews, the ability to exercise the death penalty. Very important timing. If Jesus is to die and it is to be carried out 
according to the now Roman law, then the Romans had to be the executioners. And again, didn't bother the Jews with Stephen. Wasn't an issue when they tried to stone Jesus even, but now they are seeking an execution from the governor. By the time they get through the three phases of the Gentile trials, when we get to that point, the crowd has become insane. They are bloodthirsty. They are screaming at the top of their lungs, crucify him, crucify him. It's as if in the end they they reach a level of insanity and they lose all reason. Something we've seen in our recent days in America, right? At that point, they certainly lose all mercy and most of their humanity. Hatred can do that to people. So make no mistake about it, the Jews play a prominent role in this drama. They drive Jesus to the cross. They drive this entire episode that we're in the middle of. They cannot ever be taken off the hook for the death of their Messiah. John, here in our text takes us right into the judgment hall. That's what the word praetorium means. It's the place where the procurator, the governor, held court. And we're not going to be finishing this today because this goes all into chapter 19. But for right now, our setting is right after the third phase of the Jewish trial early in the morning before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin that I told you earlier about. It happened at the break of dawn about 6 a.m. and they pronounce a death sentence on Jesus. And then John picks up the story here in verse 28. Look again with me. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. So the early Roman courts started at daybreak and they ended at sundown, just like Jewish courts. And the courts could get busy and the courts could get full. And so the the Jews made their sentence technically viable publicly at the break of dawn by passing the final sentence And then they rushed their prisoner to be the very first ones at the Roman court at the break of dawn. The hall of judgment is where Pilate set up his operation when he was in Jerusalem. Most of the time he was at Caesarea at a headquarters on the coast. And so the Jews approach Pilate's judgment hall at the very start of the morning so that they can be the very first ones in line for court that day. But they don't go in. They wouldn't enter the praetorium because they didn't want to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. Passover's later that day. They don't want ceremonial uncleanness. And so they won't enter a Gentile habitation. That would defile them. That would make them unclean and that would make them unable to eat the Passover. And by the way, there is no such ceremonial law in the Old Testament. There is no such ceremonial regulation. The rabbis had invented these kinds of things and tacked them on as they pushed the Gentiles further and further away to isolate themselves from the despised Gentiles. According to the Mishnah, the codification of Jewish law, It says the dwelling places of Gentiles are unclean. That is not the law of God. What is in the law of God is that if you touch a dead body, there is ceremonial uncleanness. Numbers 19 forbids the touching of a dead body. And to understand how crazy legalistic these rabbis were, one of the excuses that they gave was if you were a Jew, and you went into a Gentile home, you would very possibly conduct a dead body because Gentiles were thought to throw their aborted babies in the drain. So, of course, it would defile you for seven days if you happened to come into contact with that dead body. That's the excuse they use. Just crazy. So they're careful not to go inside. They stayed on the outside. 
Think about it. It is an amazing level of hypocrisy. They don't want to be defiled, but they are about to knowingly, willingly murder the Son of God at the same time. They were happy to keep the letter of their own invented law while killing the very one who came to fulfill the law of God and the one who wrote it in the first place. John Calvin wrote about this in a way that only he could. He said, these hypocrites, though they are so full of malice, ambition, fraud, cruelty, and greed that they almost infect heaven and earth with their abominable smell and are only afraid of external pollution. (laughs) Couldn't have said it better myself. Now, the trial begins formally in verse 29. Look there. Therefore, Pilate went out to them. They, They weren't coming in, so he goes out to them And now we have the first phase of the trial. The accusation. Or if you will, the indictment. You can't have a trial until you have an accusation, right? This is what Pilate wants. He's the judge. So Pilate, look next, says, What accusation do you bring against this man? You brought him here bound. Who is he? What has he done? Now, if you know the story, Pilate finds out that Jesus had done absolutely nothing wrong. He is completely innocent. And so he knows that the charges of the Jews are nothing but lies. He is a judge. And he has a sense of justice. And Roman justice was clearly defined. And whatever kind of man he was as a judge, he had the responsibility to uphold Roman law. And he did not want to condemn Jesus to death. That was not just. But he did. He knew he was innocent. He repeatedly says he is innocent. And he has him executed anyway. He tried several times to get out of it. His wife tried to get him out of it. But he never could. And so why? Why did Pilate, the Roman judge, who had to have proven something about himself to be appointed to this position, which he held for ten years, why does he cave in to the Jews and execute a man that he knew full well did not commit any crime? Well, to get the answer to that, I need to give you a little historical background. Small provinces like Israel would often have procurators and governors who were in full charge of the Roman military power that was in that area. They also had judicial responsibilities as well as administrative duties in the area. These procurators were never to accept bribes. They were not to raise taxes. That was Rome's call. And they could be removed if the people reported them to the emperor And they were determined by Rome to be unfit. And Pilate was a complete disaster. There were three famous incidents that history records that made his rule so difficult. When he first came into the area, and as I said, he was headquartered out on the coast in Caesarea, he needed to make a statement about who he was and about his power to the city of Jerusalem. And so he came into Jerusalem with soldiers. He came into Jerusalem with an entourage. And the soldiers had these banners on poles that they were carrying as they rode into the city on horseback. They had a banner with a flag on the pole and then above the flag was a bust of Caesar. It was like a a metal mold of the emperor. And he was thought of as a god. Caesar was worshipped as a god by the pagans. But to the Jews, this was a graven image. 
This was a violation of the commandments. And all previous Roman governors had removed any such offensive idols before they entered in Jerusalem. But Pilate, he refused to do so. He wanted to declare himself impervious to the Jews' wishes. And the Jews begged him, please, take them down. But he was adamant. He would not take those idols off those banners. He went back to Caesarea. And you know what happened? The Jews followed him. And they hounded him. Historians tell us for five straight days, they just kept after him and kept after him to remove those idols. Finally, he told them, meet me in the amphitheater. And they all showed up in the amphitheater. And he said to them, stop the request and go away, go back to Jerusalem or you will all be killed. At this point, they are all surrounded by Roman soldiers. And those Jews bared their necks. Go ahead. Chop our heads off. They called his bluff. And not even Pilate could bring himself to massacre defenseless men. And he was absolutely humiliated. And he gave in and he removed the images. And that's how it all started. And it didn't get any better. The Jerusalem water supply was inadequate. Pilate determined that he needed to build an aqueduct, a new one. And the people sure wanted one. But where was the money going to come from? Pilate had the answer. He robbed the temple in Jerusalem. He took a fortune out of the temple treasury which was intended for the service of God to build his aqueduct. The people were so inflamed, they rioted. So what did Pilate do? He sent soldiers into the rioting crowd and they clubbed some of them to death and he stabbed some of them to death. So once again, old Pilate's doing a masterful job securing his own popularity in Israel. But word was beginning to trickle back to Caesar, that this guy wasn't doing a very good job. But the worst episode was in Jerusalem. He was staying in the ancient palace of the Herods, and he had these shields made out of metal, and he had inscribed into these metal shields the name of Tiberius the emperor. He's trying to butter Caesar up. He had the shields made, and then they were devoted to the honor of the emperor as God, Tiberius. And again, the Jews protested. They didn't want those shields in Jerusalem. And Pilate refused to remove them. But this time, the Jews sent emissaries to Tiberius and complained about Pilate. And Tiberius sent an emissary back to Pilate. And he told Pilate, remove those shields. So now, Pilate was under constant threat of the Jews reporting him to Caesar. Chapter 19, we'll see a little later. In verse 12 of chapter 19, a little later, the Jews tell Pilate, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. In other words, we're going to go tell him again. So why doesn't Pilate release Jesus when he knows he is innocent? Blackmail. Pure and simple. His previous mistakes and misjudgment made it impossible for him to defy the Jews and to do his job. And he lost it anyway in 35 AD. And historians tell us not long after that he killed himself. Tragic figure. That's Pilate. I guess he wanted to do the right thing as a judge in one sense, but he had no courage. So he had Jesus killed to keep his job. Now let's go back to verse 29. That is, you have that background. Therefore, Pilate went out to them. And you know, when they told him who was outside, he just hated the sight of those Jews walking up. I mean, can you just see his face when they rolled up? Oh, my God. Here they come, right? He says, what accusation do you bring against this man? 
Now that is how you start a trial. What's the accusation, right? That is the first legal thing that has happened so far. Very first. Nothing legal happened in any of the Jewish trials. What accusation do you bring against this man? This formally open court proceedings at the break of dawn on Good Friday morning. Pilate assumes there has to be some crime. But what crime? And of course, this starts to become a problem for the Jews because they don't have a crime. They don't want Pilate to be a judge. They want Pilate to be an executioner. They don't want justice for Jesus. They want death. They don't want a retrial. But they're going to get one. The answer they give in verse 30 next is very interesting. They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. Really? He asked for an accusation. They accuse him of questioning their integrity. Are you insulting us like we would bring a man to you to be executed who hadn't committed a crime? And of course, that's exactly what they did. There was no accusation. They are impugning Pilate by accusing Pilate of impugning them. Who they have in their midst is the sinless, spotless, perfect in every way Son of God who had never, ever done anything ever in his life wrong in word, thought, or deed. They couldn't find one hint of a crime, and they worked at it. Believe me, if there was one, they they would have found it. They're in a tough spot right here. They need Jesus to be executed, but they can't come up with a reason. All they can do is defend themselves. If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. And here we see again, all through the trials of Jesus, his absolute innocence. Every step of the way, they can't come up with anything. And again, we ask the question, why in the world are they pressing this issue with Pilate? If they don't want a trial, why did they come? Why are they doing this? Well, verse 31 begins to tell us. Look next. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Do you understand what he just said to them? Go kill him yourself. What does your law say? You got a crime? Well, then do what you need to do according to your law. Their law was the law of Moses. As Pilate well knew, the law of Moses gave them the right of capital punishment, particularly with a blasphemer. In fact, in Leviticus 24, it was required that a blasphemer be stoned to death. So Pilate is saying, go on, judge him according to your law. I am giving you right now an exemption from Roman law. Take care of it yourself. You have my complete permission. The Romans did respect the laws of conquered peoples and gave them some latitude in the administration of their laws and justice. And Pilate knew that they wanted to kill Jesus. He didn't want to do it. He had some sense of justice. There was no crime against Rome for sure. So he frees them to handle it themselves. And then next in verse 31 The Jews have an amazing response. The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. Now they are quoting Roman law. We can't do it. It would be a violation of Roman law. But they had just been told by the representative of Roman law to go do whatever they wanted to do. So why in the world don't they just go do it? They just got permission from the governor. Why are they going to force this issue through Pilate, through Herod, and back to Pilate? Well, verse 32 gives you the very clear 
answer. Look at it with me. To fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. I cannot overemphasize. What an incredibly powerful statement that is. If those Jews at that moment had walked away with Jesus and stoned him to death, then Jesus is not the Son of God, the Bible is not true, and all of Christianity implodes on itself. Why? Why do I say that? Well, back in John 12, in verse 32, Jesus said this, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself, verse 33, but he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. He was going to die by being lifted up. That's how Romans executed criminals. They lifted them up on a cross. The Jews executed people by throwing them down and stoning them to death. Jesus said, I will die by being lifted up, not by being thrown down. He prophesied his own crucifixion. So you see, if the Jews had taken him and stoned him, then Jesus was wrong. If Jesus is wrong, he's not God. He's not the truth. And Christianity collapses. Jesus is a fraud. The Bible is full of lies. Listen to me. Jesus had to die by being lifted up. That is a Roman means of execution. He was not going to be thrown down and crushed and mutilated by being stoned. He dictates how this goes. Think back, the Jews tried to stone him multiple times in his life. Like I said, Nazareth tried to throw him off a cliff, but they were never able to pull it off successfully as he always just somehow disappeared from their midst. Because it was not the time and it was not the way that God intended. Isn't it amazing to understand in all this frenzied madness that we're looking at, it's all under the complete control of a sovereign God to fulfill specific words that Jesus said. Some might not think that's a, but a small detail, but I'm telling you it's not. If Jesus ever spoke a lie or said something that wasn't true, then he's not who he claimed to be. And we're wasting our time in here. So the accusation part of the trial fails. There is no accusation. And now we come to the second part of the trial before Pilate, the interrogation. Look at verse 33. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium. This is after he'd been outside talking to the Jews. Now he comes back. And next it says, He summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Now the Jews had said he perverts the nation, he forbids tribute to Caesar, he says he's a king, but there's nothing in any of that that rose to any kind of problem for Rome. This is not a dangerous man. This is not some man who's starting a revolution. He's not perverting the nation. He's not forbidding to pay taxes. In fact, he had the disciples pay all their taxes. The only thing that Pilate could ask him was, Are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Let me tell you how it goes in the Greek. It's like this. You? You are the king of the Jews? That's the emphasis. As if, this is absurd. Look at this guy. This is ridiculous. You are the one that everybody is so worked up about. He probably remembered back to the day when he came into Jerusalem and all the thousands were hailing. I mean, that was breaking news right there what happened on that day. You're the one? It's you. You're no threat. Look again in verse 34. Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Is this your charge, Pilate? I'm in your court. Are you actually charging me with something? Is this your idea that I'm an insurrectionist, that I'm a threat to Caesar? Is this your idea? Or are you just an errand boy for the Jews? 
Verse 35, Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Are you kidding? I don't carry their agenda. And then next he says, Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? And again, the culpability of the leaders of Israel for the execution of Jesus just constantly comes up. Pilate is saying, look, I have nothing to do with you. You have nothing to do with me or Rome. You're no threat. If you're some kind of a king, I mean, I don't know anything about that. It's your own people who have delivered you to me. And again, what in the world have you done? There's no crime. He can't find any. Pilate's thinking, this is some kind of Jewish issue here. I mean, he knew that the Jews would welcome a real king who could gather an army and overthrow Rome. And he also knew that the Jews wanted Jesus dead for envy or jealousy or whatever their reason was. Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Jesus lets him know, yes, I am a king, but not in the sense that you know a king. My kingdom is not of this world. And he's not a king because his subjects made him a king. He's not a king because it ran in the family. He is a king by nature. He is a king over a spiritual dominion. He rules a kingdom where he creates, then regenerates his own subjects. The kingship of Jesus is a realm all by itself. It is not of this world. Man's world produces many kings, but King Jesus rules a heavenly, eternal, supernatural kingdom. There was nothing about Jesus that resembled an earthly king to Pilate, and Pilate was right about that, but he was dead wrong in thinking that Jesus was not a king. He's the king of kings. Revelation 11 points to the day when the kingdoms of this world will become kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And at that minute, He's going to crush all the petty monarchs of this world. All the pilots will one day feel the power of His reign when He returns to establish His kingdom forever. Now historians say Pilate had about 3,000 troops available In Egypt, I mean, I'm sorry, in Israel. If Jesus had led a revolt, the massive tens of, probably hundreds of thousands of Jews hailing as Messiah, they they possibly could have overthrown the Romans. But he had no intention of doing that. He said, my kingdom is not of this world or my servants would be fighting. Look at verse 37. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world. Now notice what two things are right there. For this I have been born, that's his humanity. For this I have come into the world, that's his deity. John constantly is bringing this up. In so many ways. He existed before he was born. He existed in heaven. He came into the world. For this I was born. That was his humanity. For this I come into the world. That's his deity. He came from glory. And why did he come? We'll look next in the verse. To testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. I am a king. For this I came into the world, pre-existent God. He comes into the world in human form. Before Abraham was, I am John 8. He came to testify to the truth. What truth? The truth of the kingdom. The truth of his nature. The truth of God. The truth of man. The truth of sin. The truth of salvation. The truth about heaven. The truth about hell. The truth about the gospel. He came to tell men the truth about themselves, about life, about death, about eternity. He said, I am the truth. John says, if you obey him, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? Well, for one thing, free from the search for the truth. 
Once you come to Christ on His terms of repentance and faith, guess what? Your search is over. You know the truth. That statement at the end of verse 37 is a very exclusive statement. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That means there isn't a person on this planet and never has been who knows the truth and rejects Christ. Not one. If you reject Christ, you do not know the truth because He is the truth. And in our last verse of the day, we meet Pilate, the first postmodern cynic. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? And there's postmodernism. What is truth? Right? There is no absolute truth. Pilate gave up on it. Postmodernism has given up. There is no such thing as that. Don't you love the people? Well, my truth is this, and my truth is that. Give me a break. There's only one truth. Jesus says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. If you are not hearing the voice of Christ revealed in the pages of Scripture, you do not know the truth at all. You may know the truth about temporal things, but you don't know the truth about things that matter most. And that's the truth about eternal things. Guess what? Earthly life is very temporary. Eternity is forever. Sure is interesting to live in this cynical, postmodern culture where people have decided there's no such thing as absolute truth. And then we as Christians step up and say, yes, there is. There is absolute truth in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, there is absolute truth in His infallible, inerrant Word. Our job is just to tell them about the truth. The Holy Spirit's job is to do the convincing of the truth. So, today we have had the initial effort at an indictment and accusation that fell Then we saw the interrogation, and now what's the decision? We'll close with this. After Pilate responded, what is truth? Look next in verse 38. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. Not guilty. Clearly not guilty. Later in chapter 19, we're going to see that Pilate had him scourged. And in chapter 19, verse 4, he came out again to the Jews and said, Behold, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And then in verse 6 of chapter 19, So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. He just keeps saying it over and over and over, not guilty. Because he knew it was true. Nothing could be said about Jesus. Because he really is the lamb without spot. He really is the lamb without blemish. He really is the king of truth. And what we will continue to see as we study throughout the rest of this Good Friday is his glorious perfection shining through the thick black darkness of the depravity of man. We'll continue with that next time. But for now, we get an awesome privilege right now. We get an awesome privilege as Christian people on this Lord's Day of being obedient to a direct command given to us by the Lord Jesus himself. All of our focus right now is going to turn to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he performed on our behalf for sinners like us through the means of of the Lord's table. And just to set the tone of the weightiness 